Wonderful. Well, a big warm welcome to everyone that's streaming this morning, and we wanted to welcome you to Gateway Online as well, all our missionaries overseas, and uh, they're right across the, the globe, and uh, if you're tuning in this week, good morning to you. Well, this morning we've got a very special ministry, and we're so delighted to welcome uh, again to the, to the pulpit uh, someone that we are developing in this gift and uh, intentionally positioning her to actually be a communicator of the gospel. So why don't we stand this morning and welcome... To the pulpit, Kirsty Turner. So hard, just give me a sec to get myself organised up here. This is wobbly, this thing, isn't it? Okay, so can I tell you what I did yesterday, just for fun? I think I should. So we had the most amazing Christmas celebration yesterday with my family. So Merry Christmas. (laughs) I know we're just a little bit late, but um, Simon and I were away for Christmas and then our kids were away in turn. And then our kids got the thing. And then that put us back another week and a half. And then we had another really significant and special celebration in our family. So yesterday was the the day. We went to the... um, Went into the... um, into the vineyard area. What's that? The Hunter Valley. And we, um, <laughs> my brain just fell out then. So <laughs> we went into the Hunter Valley and we, we ate cheese and we celebrated and we had a home cooked meal and I had a special friend who came and helped. And it was the most beautiful thing to be with family. That's what Gateway's like, isn't it? It's like coming, being with family. And so we come and when we first came here, we were so attracted by this sense of union that this place has with God so attracted by the teaching and the sense of identity in Jesus that is proclaimed and grown into and developed in this place. So when Craig gave me the opportunity to get up here and say what I'd like to say, I thought that we should go with that kind of theme. So we're going to talk today about identity in an interesting way, but it's about identity. And I'd like to encourage you with some things about my identity and some truths and some understandings that I've come to know about myself in Jesus as we go through this journey. So let's talk about paradigms. Paradigms, of course, are, it's like a standard or a perspective or a way of viewing the world. And I love it when I come across people who have a very different paradigm to me. I'm like a collector of the different and the unique. And so I... (laughs) I wonder why, right? <laughs> and so I, col- I collect people and I'm like, I'm like, ooh, you think differently to me. I want to hear about that. Tell me more. I would hate to be one of those people who lives in a silo where everybody is exactly the same as me and everybody has the same idea. So I collect these people and I'm like, tell me more. And I love that moment. You see it when you're teaching. You love that moment when a paradigm shifts. When someone has a paradigm and it gets shifted into something completely different, the amazing thing when you teach little people is they live outwardly. So you get to see everything, (laughs) right? Literally everything. (laughs) Even at the Hunter Valley yesterday, walked into the cheese place we're going to visit. A kid looks at me, looks at me, smiles, gives me a nod about this big. Year three or four. So I looked at him, smiled, gave him a nod, said, hey, can't go anywhere as a teacher, right? <laughs> They're everywhere, those children. So we have this, um, this, but you see them have these paradigm shifts as a child and they live so outwardly that you get to see what that does to transform the way they think and the way they behave. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And the topic that we're going to be talking about is Repentance. Now, sometimes when we hear the word repentance, we think, (gasps) but we're going to change our mind today about that. We're going to have a different paradigm about repentance by the time we're done. Because we're going to do that, right? We're going to step in. We're going to step up. We're going to step in. We're going to step towards God. We're actually going to step towards the truth of who we are, the identity. So there's this beautiful quote I love to think of when I think of paradigms. It's from the Gospel in Ten Words by Paul Ellis. He is amazing. That little, it's a little book. It's a really good book. And think about this with paradigm shifts. It's a good example. We are trying to love God because we think we are supposed to. 
instead of basking in the light of his divine love, we are trying to produce light on our own. The problem is we can't do it. We are like a moon trying to be a sun. Imagine the paradigm shift of going from trying to be a sun to trying to be a moon and what that does to our identity, trying to reflect the light of Christ in our life. Let's go for that kind of paradigm shift today. So we're going to reimagine repentance. Let's start with a little bit of foundation about who God is. It's important, right? It's important to know who God is and how he represents these things to us when we're talking particularly about things that might might make our heart go a little bit oh dear so Romans 2 4 just the end a little bit says God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance it's not a big stick it's not a harsh voice it's not a father looking down on you with disapproval that leads us towards repentance, it's kindness. Isn't it easy to follow kindness? Don't you find that easy? If you find a kind person, you want to be with them, you want to hang around them, you want to follow them places. So it's God's kindness. 1 John 4, 8. You know, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. We can't actually disengage repentance out of the love, kindness and grace of God. That would be doing repentance a huge disservice for what it does for our identity. 1 John 4, 18. So we've just, we've just determined that God is love, right? Next thing, there is no fear in love. Mm-mm. We don't fear, we don't run away. We don't hide, no fear in love, because perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. That's not on the agenda. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So we've got this loving God who's drawing us towards him with his his kindness. And it's not about fear. And, of course, my favourite, Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Zero. It's not actually on the agenda. We feel like it might be sometimes, but sometimes our feelings lie to us. Sometimes we shouldn't just listen to them. Sometimes we just go, no, I know the truth. I know that there is no condemnation. And, lastly, Psalm 91, 2. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. He's a trustworthy God. He is a safe place to run to. I always think of a small child running towards their father. You know, I can remember my kids running towards him if they were scared running towards their earthly father. Imagine how much more we can run towards our heavenly father. How much safer he is, even even more safe than our good examples of fathers that we see. So we're going to think about repentance in two ways. The first way is an Old Testament understanding of repentance. It's basically can sum it up as a repentance as returning you hear that definition of lot turning away from sin and towards God, right? A returning to God, a reorientation to God. There's no real Hebrew word for the word repentance. There's no sort of straight out correlating word in the Old Testament. Rather, it's sort of a group of concepts and ideas ideas and godly principles that God puts forward that talk about a radical change in thinking, a returning, a radical change in thinking from this over here, sin, the idolatry, the turning away from God and back towards the God that is true, the God that is there for us, the God that gives us our identity. 
And so, of course, we can see this all through the Old Testament. You just have to have a little look at the kings, those who turned towards God, those who turned away from God, what happened, how God covenantially, as a plan, as a way of being gracious and kind to his people, re-led them back to him. He returned them to himself. Circumstances, the ways he did it, showing them the truth, he returned his people to him. And of course, probably the biggest example of that is in the Psalms. God, I love the Psalms. God, I love being able to take a little peek into someone's personal and intimate relationship with Jesus, right? So let's have a look, of course, at Psalm 51. We all probably know the story, but let me give you a tiny little bit of background. We have King David, sees Beth the Sheba on a, a um, rooftop, gets into a very um, ungodly situation with her where there's a very direct power imbalance and he takes advantage of her. Then when he recognises he's done the wrong thing and there are ramifications of the wrong thing as well, he sends um, her husband away into war to make sure that there's no knowledge of what he's done. He's trying to hide his sin. And so we get to the very first verse of Psalm 51 and it says, have mercy on me, O God. He's been confronted by the, by the prophet Nathan and he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. He understands the love of God. He understands the love of God. He says, according to your unfailing love. He knows that he can come with his sin to a father that loves him. And, you know, David is painfully aware of his sin, right? Verse 3, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. I think if we, we, we don't really need to look that deep to find a moment in our life where we felt like that. Like the sin's the biggest thing in our world right now. David knows that God holds the solution though because in verse 7 he says, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. He knows where the solution is. He knows that God holds the solution to his sin. And he knows that God will restore him and change him too. I will be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow. And in verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant a willing spirit to sustain me. He understands the transformation that comes with repentance as well. So we have this model of repentance in the Old Testament, a returning towards God, a reorientating, not about shame, not about condemnation, but about restoration. And it's beautiful and it's good. And when we've experienced that, we know. It's often our first experience of the love of God, isn't it? When we come to him for the first time, it's our experience of, wow, as a God who loves me, I'm forgiven. It's so beautiful. Here's a joke for the old people. You ready? In the words, oh, okay, it might just be me then. In the words of Tim Shaw, but wait, there's more. Oh, a few people got it. I'll, I'll be impressed. I promise not to try, try to sell you steak knives. Pinky promised not to do that. But there is more. I love how when you read the Old Testament and the New Testament, often you get a beautiful thing. The returning repentance of the Old Testament is a beautiful thing. But then there's a layer 
There's another depth. There's a new revelation in the New Testament. There's a new thing. There's more. And we want the more, right? We want the more of God. And so we're going to expand our understanding of repentance. We have repentance as returning. It's good. It's important, but it's incomplete. The picture is incomplete if we only attach repentance to a returning. There's this word I have learned. It's called metanoia. It's a great word. And it's typically trans later in the New Testament, into the word repentance. So this time there is a direct one-on-one kind of relationship between a word and repentance. But when we read the Bible and we see the word repentance, we often misinterpret that word. And we take that word that's so vast because our God is vast and we narrow it down into this tiny little thing called penance. We take this, the the plan of restoration and identity from Almighty God and we make it about, frankly, ourselves. Our sin, my sin, my shame, my guilt, my need to try to make it better with that person. It almost becomes a behaviour management plan. And I know we in our culture here at this church probably would not use the word penance, but I can look at my life and find times that I've taken repentance and made it into penance. We don't want to do that. Because metanoia is the word that is actually used. Meta is a prefix, right? It goes on the beginning of a word. And it implies a deepening or expansion of something. An opening up to something of a higher level of reality. And noia, that part of the word, is a way of thinking. Remember we talked about paradigms earlier? It's a way of thinking. It's a paradigm encompassing both our intellect and our heart, both. And so we think about, when we think about meta, we often think about the word metamorphosis, don't we? In the same way that a butterfly goes into a cocoon, sorry, a caterpillar goes into a cocoon and comes out a butterfly, repentance brings us a transformation, metanoia, a deepening of our paradigm, a paradigm shift. You know those moments where it's like, you see something, you hear something, God puts something on your heart and it's almost like a nuclear explosion goes off in your heart and your mind. That's metanoia. That's what we're talking about. Isn't that exciting? Hasn't repentance turned out to be oh so exciting? (laughs) Really exciting. I mean, that's what I want. I want God to reach out in my life and my mind to go. <laughs> yes, a yes to that. And so let's 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 look at it from a no- couple of different angles. Metanoia, paradigm shifts shift that changes the way we perceive and make sense of our world. A retune. This is the word, not return. Retune. A retune back to seeing ourselves the way God sees us. Seeing ourselves the way he sees us as a forgiven, loved, restored child of his. Having a fresh perspective on how God designed us to be, what he designed us to do. The individuality in that still, but our destiny really. It's a radical change of mind. It's not a little tiny whisper in your mind. It's a radical, mind-blowing, nuclear bomb, remember? Radical change of mind. Or an intellectual reorientation 
involving, I love this, a change of habits, thoughts, and actions. Habits, thoughts, and actions change because we're actually embracing a new way of thinking and living. And it's a, it's a can't-go-back-from-it moment too. I hope you have had a moment in your life where you have had such a from God that you wake up the next day and you do something out of your normal character that has been your pattern and you think to yourself, my goodness, it's stuck. Of course it's stuck. He's almighty God. Of course those moments stick. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about a little inkling of maybe I'll sort of consider whether I change in this way, maybe sort of kinder. I can take it back if I want to. No, you can't take this back. This is almighty God exploding your paradigm, bringing a new thing. Literally having our minds blown. That's what we're aiming for. So exciting. (laughs) And metanoia, the tuning in repentance of metanoia, is the doorway into renewing our mind. Let me show you how I know that. Romans 12, 2. It says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I don't know about you, but I've had times where I just did not know something. When my paradigm shifted, when that little happened, it changed everything. How do we not conform? Because the mind has been changed. How do we be transformed? Because our mind has been changed. How do we renew our mind? Or even because our mind has been changed, maybe? So amazing that God sets us up for success. He doesn't say repent and then say, do it yourself. Come on, figure it out. He goes, repent, and then he goes, here is my metanoia, my tuning in repentance. I am going to blow your mind you are never going to be the same so here we go remember it changes habits patterns ways of thinking when we have that metanoia from god it will increase your desire for him because we can't know more about him and more about ourselves as his children without it increasing our desire for him So if you're struggling to find a desire for him, if you feel like you're in a barren place, what about deep gratitude? How grateful are we when we experience that kind of transformative breakthrough in our lives? I'm going to say this twice because a friend I read this to yesterday told me I should. This is Melissa's gift to you. The ability to look out from reality rather than looking out at reality. I'm going to say it again. The ability to look out from reality, so my reality's here and I'm looking out from it to the world, rather than looking out at reality. If we do not know who we are, If our identity has not been transformed by metanoia, we look out looking for reality. And there are 423 versions of reality out there and 423 of them are not awesome. Because our reality is we're a child of God. Our reality is I'm forgiven. Our reality is I have authority. When our mind goes, we know who we are. We act out of that rather than looking out in the world to find out who we are. That can include people. 
Like if I if I love Kylie and I I I I think she's awesome, but I look to her to find out who I am. She can reflect God to me, but she can't be God to me. She cannot my mind, can she? She can't do it. She's awesome, and I love her, and I'd love her to say nice things about me too. That's great. But she can't do what God can do. So we're looking out from a place of identity in God. We end up with a deeper understanding of people, relationships, situations. You know those people who you just think, gee, you've really got this figured out? You figured out how to approach our situation? Probably metanoia. Probably they've had a paradigm shift, they've had their mind blown by the Spirit of God, and they're seeing things in a way you don't see them because they've had an experience of God. Emotional maturity, right? Who'd like a little bit more emotional maturity? <laughs> Especially when I, I, I heard Gary say the other day about being squeezed. When I'm squeezed, I want people to see Jesus. <laughs> and you get it, don't you? Sometimes we're emotionally squeezed. So when we're going through a hard time, it's harder to be, harder to keep our inhibitions intact, isn't it? It's harder to express ourselves with love. But metanoia, hard times, we become emotionally mature. We, we can adapt. We can be resilient, persevere, be hopeful, hopeful in a hard time. We can be innovative. All because of the paranoia. Remember, we're still talking about repentance, right? I told you it's exciting. We're still talking about repentance. When I say metanoia, we are talking about repentance. It's exciting. It's so positive. There is not one single negative thing that comes from repentance. When we have these moments, we get to see not just who we are, but what we can become. We can be forward-facing. We can look out into the world and say, what can I do? How can I be you, Jesus, to this person? So I'd like to share with you an experience of my metanoia. Um, I've had... Now, this is going to be a little bit obtuse, okay? I'm going to talk around a situation, but I'm not really going to tell you any details because the details aren't mine to tell, okay? So come with me because I'm talking about me and my transformation. There's a person in my life, a very significant person, who over a number of years, was having a very, very dark time in their life. Very dark time. And as someone who loved this person, it's, have you, it's incredibly painful, isn't it, to watch someone you love go through pain. Really significant amounts of pain. And of course, at one stage, it occurred to me that everyone's acting out of pain here, right? That person's acting out of pain. I'm acting out of pain. We go to Jesus. And then we have that moment. <sighs> Do you know that sometimes we know in our being that we're loved by God, but we don't really know how much? Sometimes we know that God is love, but we kind of think God is love based on a behaviour, on our behaviour. God is love when we behave well. God is love when we represent him, ourselves well. God is love when I do the right thing every time. Sounds exhausting, right? So I had this moment where my brain, my mind was blown. By God's love. His love for me. His love for this other person. Not one or the other. It wasn't just his love for me, it was his love for that person as well. And there was this moment that I, th I couldn't go back. Everything in the way I related to this person changed. 
you know, it became way, way, way easier to speak with love when they're not. To seek to understand this person where they have no intention of trying to understand me. A couple of phrases come to my mind. Now, you might hear me say this. Some of you probably have already. Love wins. The, and so now my default, my default, not because I'm awesome, but because I had my mind blown by the love of God and by a new paradigm, a new depth of what the love of God is, that I can be a very different person relating. It's changed my habits. It's changed the way I approach this person. It's changed the way I communicate with this person. And, you know, not only is that a beautiful transformation in me, I love that, a beautiful transformation in me, but it's also entirely transformed my relationship with that person. Entirely. This is a person who I thought we might never have anything other than broken relationship. And I thought that not just for a little while. I thought that probably for at least 18 months. But that moment with God, and everything changed. And now we have this beautiful, warm, hysterical relationship. Are our paradigms even similar to each other? No. Mm -mm. Nope. But love wins. And when I think, when it, when it, when it, when it sort of creeps up on me, maybe I'm tired, maybe I'm in pain, and something creeps up on me, I hear just a gentle reminder from the Spirit, what would love do? What would love do? And that's enough to remind me of the paradigm shift, the metanoia that I've had. So, isn't it exciting? Who's excited? Is anybody excited yet? A couple of people are. Woo! Yes. <laughs> Two or three people are excited. So, when we think of repentance, should we be thinking of returning? Yes. Absolutely. There is still a functional, godly practice of returning to God when we sin. Not out of shame, not because of a, a um, condemning that comes in our spirit, but to return to good relationship with him. And alongside that, as well as that, we are going to retune into God. We are going to allow him to blow our mind so that we can be who he really made us to be. We can act who he really made us to act like. We can be the person he made us to be. We can look forward with hope. We can renew our mind. We can be different. It's almost like it's the stamp. The stamp of the Holy Spirit that people around us see. And it all comes through repentance. And repentance is a posture we can choose. It does take humility to say either for returning, agreeing with God that I sinned, asking him to forgive us, to restore who we are, absolutely takes humility. So does metanoia. Because those paradigms that we have, those perspectives, 
Sometimes we like to hold fast because we like to think we're right. I like to think I'm right. <laughs> Ask your husband or wife if, if you like to think you're right. It's, it's a thing. We like to think we're right. We like to think we've got it figured out. We like to think we're even doing our best, maybe. But God's not actually asking us to do our best. He's asking us to come to him with humility, to say yes. We say yes. Is it a work? No. We're not working at repentance, because again, we'd be back at our behaviour modification plan, wouldn't we? So we're not working at repentance, but we are saying yes to repentance. We are stepping in and saying yes to the returning and the returning. Now, a lot of us have the returning thing kind of figured. I love this concept of metanoia because it's actually changed my paradigm. I've had a paradigm shift. My mind went... So I had my metanoia about metanoia. I know it's daggy. Sorry. But it's, it's true. And maybe it's your day too. Maybe it's your day for metanoia about metanoia. Maybe it's your day for your brain to be... Your thinking to be changed, your habits, your behaviour to change. For you to step one step further into the identity that Jesus bought for you. It's exciting. Let me read you a quote. This quote is about breakthrough because I think that metanoia is the doorway. Breakthrough involves a shift in your understanding of the world. There's the metanoia. Because the lens through which you view the world has been suddenly gloriously changed. A breakthrough is a sudden advance in your knowledge or understanding that moves you past a barrier, you have a barrier, past a barrier, and makes you see things, understand things in a new way. I'd like to think that that kind of breakthrough in our spiritual lives wasn't rare. I'd like to think that instead of each of us having five or six times over the last 30 years that we can point to and say, I had breakthrough from Jesus. What about if we make it an ongoing, constant stream of metanoia? What if in every situation, every day we went, God, why didn't you blow my mind today? I'm, 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 I'm waiting. Come on. Do you think that if we approached God like that, he would blow our mind more often than five or six times in the last 30 years? I think so. So, that's the encouragement today. In just a minute, we're going to ask God to blow our mind. And my invitation to you is that you will come with me. It's like a grand adventure. So my invitation is to come with me for ongoing, continuous metanoia, continuous breakthroughs, continuous posture of repentance. Maybe we can make 2024 the year where we posture ourselves in repentance, where we say yes to metanoia, where we allow God to blow our mind. So, okay, you coming with me? Standing up. Let's go. We're going to stand. Close our eyes. Pop your hand on your heart. Take a breath. Focus on the love of God. Focus on his kindness drawing you straight into having your mind blown. 
if you can, repeat after me. Thank you, Lord, that repentance is positive. I choose to carry a posture of repentance. I willingly confess my wrongdoings and mistakes. Thank you for your forgiveness as I return to you. Retune me, Lord. Renew my mind. I want to see how you see. I want to be all you have designed me to be. I give you full permission to blow my mind. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for metanoia. Thank you for repentance. Thank you for the path you paved for us to know who we are, who you are, and to act out of it. We ask, Lord, that day by day you would, you would blow our mind with your love, with your goodness, with your plan and purpose for who we are designed to be. We declare that 2024 is a year that we will stand in repentance, waiting for you to blow our mind and that we will both return to you and retune to you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Great job. So good. So I wonder, could we be a people this year that repent? Doesn't sound like a fun thing to do if you're in the Old Testament. But I tell you what, we're New Covenant people. Repent. Turn to God. Not only are your sins wiped away, but it says in Acts 3, times of refreshing will be experienced. I feel prophetically over us this morning, there are some people, you're tired, you burn out, you're frustrated, you feel like you've tried everything. Well, guess what? The Lord's given you a tool this morning. Repent. Turn to God, but retune in Him and watch His refreshing come. And if you need refreshing this morning, I feel like there are, there's a bunch of you here this morning that are just needing a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. We're going to have our ministry team come and they're going to be here just to pray and gather with you and believe God for a fresh touch in 2024. Let's start the year with a spirit and a humility to repent. Amen. If you're here this morning, you've never said yes to Jesus. One of the greatest things you can do is repent. Turn to God. Jesus came to earth, he died on a cross, and he rose again for the forgiveness of your wrongdoing and sin. And by saying yes to him, you are turned from a place of bondage into a place of freedom where God cleanses you and washes you free and sets you on a new path. If you're here this morning and you've never done that, you've never said yes to Jesus, you've never asked God to come into your life and set you free from your area of wrongdoing, just give me a quick wave and I'd love to just pray for you before we finish the service this morning. Is there anybody here that's saying, yeah, that's me, Craig. I've never done that, but I'd love to turn to God this morning. I want to receive Christ into my life. Is there anybody this morning that says, that's me? I don't want to miss you if you're here, but I just wanted to check. Beautiful. We're all in. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So ministry team, why don't you come? Just come quickly now. If you need a fresh time of refreshing, let's repent and let the refreshing of the Lord come. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Well done, Kirsty. That was fantastic. Well, well, well done. Wonderful. But ministry team, come.
come and receive prayer. But may the Lord bless you, keep you. May his face continue to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. God bless.